media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, recycling trade publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Tim Cyclesman Wood, editor of Cycles News and Views on Cyclesman.com. Welcome back to the show, Tim. Jim, thanks for having me. And and Tim, uh, just before we get going, if people want to get a little bit more of a background about your philosophy and and how you trade, why you trade, and how you got into the business. Uh, there's also an interview uh, with you on uh, technicaltraders.com that they just might want to listen to so they can find out just a little bit more about Tim Wood. Yeah, thank you for that. That was, um, that was pretty cool. It was quite a surprise. I had no idea what we were even going to do when we did that interview. So yeah. thank you. So people can get some background. Now, uh, Tim, the thing that you're really concerned about is inflation and interest rates. A, is the Fed really going to hike rates at least high enough to start wrestling inflation? Um, no. This, this is quite a unique situation. Um, and it's, it, it's, it's hard to even discuss because it's such a conflict. And let me begin to try to explain. Um, you know, I have a, a Fed model, and I mean, it has a track record, I and mean, it goes back into, you know, I have Fed data, uh, or uh, interest rate data going back into the, into the 40s, and, um, it's a, it's a, um, it, it's real simple. Um, you know, the Fed follows short-term interest rates. And, and adjust accordingly. Now, how aggressive they want to be, you know, there's some variables there, but you can, there's also some statistics you can wrap around that and, and, you know, depending on the environment you're in. And, you know, for example, in the pre-2008 world, um, they were a little more aggressive as far as where they would peg the discount rate versus the, the shorter term T-bill rates. And then in the post-2008 world, they've let that margin, that spread be a lot tighter. You know, they, so in other words, they've let the rates be you know the uh, the the T bill rate be much closer. They've allowed it to be much closer to the to the discount rate, and so there are some there there are some. There's also within that model there is some um, a phenomenon, if you will, that has occurred <clears throat> that has projected or foretold of the rate hiking cycle. And um, the funny thing is, is that we've or I say we I, I, I the model it gave us that reading back in February before the first rate hike ever even began. And um, so that tells us that it, it didn't say that they're not going to raise because um, when we've seen that before, they, they've made, a, a you know, anywhere there's been, either they did nothing or they'd make a couple of, of raises, one to three raises, depending on the scenario. But at most, according to that model, there's or when this has happened, there's only been three. And... Um, I suspect that they really have no choice but to continue to raise because of the, you know, uh, the short-term rates rising. But at the same time, I think that they're going to raise until they break something. Uh, because the, the, what this is telling us is that the, um, you know, like I said, it's the first time ever that you've seen that signal before you even began a rate hiking cycle. I mean, usually it occurs like at the 1980, 81, 82 top. In that period, it happens several times. So it happens at the top of a cycle, not at a bottom. So that fundamentally is telling us that something is wrong, you know. Uh, and I think what it's one, I think it's telling us that, that there is a tremendous deflationary force, and this is where the conflict comes to my mind. It, it sounds crazy to say but it's telling us there is a tremendous deflationary force out there, but it's being masked over, if you will, by the current inflation. I'm not denying the inflation. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I see it. Like I said, I go to the grocery store too, but 
it is supply chain driven. We've talked about that all along. And so I think that these low interest rates in this environment, I mean, give you another statistic. This three-year cycle advance in the CRB is the single highest percentage advancing um, cycle in the history of that data, which I have going back into the 60s. It, which think about what I'm saying that 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 eclipses the, the run up in the 80s and the percent advance we saw in 2007 and into 2008. But interest rates are at one percent on you know on the T bill, and and we're sitting at one percent on the discount rate. In 1980, I think they the discount rate. I don't have the number in front of me, but, but I want to say it was at 16 and a half. And even uh, with some of the other uh, rate hiking cycles since, you know, we were we've been six, eight, ten percent. So it's unprecedented where we are. And so what I'm saying is, when you look beneath the surface and study what this is telling us, it's it's saying that it's not monetary; it's supply chain driven. And so how that resolves, I don't know. Uh, like I said, that's a conflict even in my own mind. But the data is what the data is. And so I um, I think the key with this whole bubble, like we've talked about, this whole environment we're in, we, we're seeing the issues with equities. And I think that um, if and when, or not if, but when, I mean, everything peaks eventually, but when we see the top in commodities, then I think it's going to put the whole house of cards at risk. Now, uh, when you were talking about interest rates, I remember the 1981 Canadian government savings bond paid 21% because I scraped together every penny I could to buy it. And it ended up uh, financing my wife's uh, master's degree. Because Smart of, move. Yeah. Yeah, it's insane. Right. So we know interest rates can go that high. Uh, developers were bulldozing the houses they had built because nobody could afford uh, a 19% mortgage. <laughs> but th- yeah, and think about what I'm saying. So, so why have we just seen? I mean, think about that. And and I'm not asking you for the answer. I'm just saying when you think about it, it's telling us that something's not right. When you have when we've just seen the highest single percentage advancing three-year cycle advance from bottom to what is so far the top in this advance, the the, the single uh, largest percentage advance with interest rates at 1%. And when I say interest rates, again, I'm, I'm, I'm referring to the short-term to T-bill rate, uh, the 30 mo- uh, three-month T-bill rate. You know, I think we're at 1.07 the other day. So something is not right. And like I said, that tells us that I think what it's telling us is that it, it, it is strictly supply chain driven. And then the other thing, <clears throat> that is confirming that is the dollar because we're, we've seen now the dollars off today. There's some cycle tops due, and in fact, I've, you know, I've been, it's been stretched. It's been extremely stretched, and I think we're rolling into some intermediate term lows now in the dollar. I hope because it needs to breathe. But the fact that the dollar has gone up, you know, we had the four year cycle low in uh, January of 21, and the fact that the dollar has advanced as much as it has. I mean, we're back to O2 levels in the dollar. Um, and you know, say that another way, you know, we're back to levels not seen since 2002. So think about that, and and we're seeing that in an environment with advancing commodities. So we have the strong dollar and weak interest rates, along with inflation, and that doesn't fit. So something's wrong, and the question is, what is it? And I think the answer is, is that this is not monetary. Again, it's supply chain, and when we see interest rates peak. Back to the model, it's telling us that we're at the beginning of the end of a rate hiking cycle. So I think when we see commodities and interest rates peak, um, then it sets us up for, um, I, I think that's where the, the real party begins. But the, the sheer thought of peaking interest rates and commodity prices, that's where the conflict is, even in my own mind. Like I said, I know it sounds crazy, but that's, that's, that's what I see on the horizon. We'll have more with Tim Cyclesman Wood right after this. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts. 
radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Tim Cycles Man Wood. Tim, uh, oil prices are up as we speak, but how long can that be sustained, uh, especially in light of a possible recession when people drive less? Well, <clears throat> again, I, 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 oil, that's, I guess, really one of the, one of the big pieces with the CRB and, um, uh, the peaking of commodities. Obviously, there's other things there. When I say commodities, we're looking at wheat and corn and the price of cattle and you know everything, natural gas, all of it. But I think I think crude oil is a is a is a a major marker in the peaking of commodities. And uh, I do not have at this moment an indication that this run is over, but I do think we're in the zone where it could be. And what I look for specifically with the cycles is specific structure to tell me that the market has peaked. And I need to see, you know, I've, I've got to see my short-term cycle and i got to see what the structure with that brings. But I think we're in the zone where we could see a turn. But until we do, look, this thing, thing can press higher. I'm not saying it's done. I'm saying that, um, well, like I said, I, I think there's a top out there. And when, when uh, obviously, that's an obvious statement, but I mean, I think there's a, an intermediate top. I think we're pressing into a top probably sooner than people expect. And I'll be able to recognize it with the structure, which we do not have at this moment. Now, the Fed, I think, is caught between a rock and a hard place. They know if they increase interest rates to the point they stop inflation, that will also create a situation where companies will have to shut down production, lay off people, and so on. Unemployment's never pretty. Right now, with inflation, we also have record low unemployment numbers, and it's hard to find working talent, and wages really haven't kept up with inflation. And apart from John Deere and a few other suppliers, we haven't seen major strikes for people trying to catch up to it. So, so far, producers are winning in the inflation front. Is there any point where they'll say, ah, we've made enough money, we're going to stop charging so much? <laughs> I, I, yes, I think that's part of the inevitable unwinding of the bubble. And until we get there, I think, and, and, and we describe that offline, there's a word for that, mm. until we get there, I think it's going to continue. I see it every day. I see it every single day. I observed it at the grocery store this week. I saw, this is a license, this inflationary environment that we're in, um, like I said, it is supply chain driven, is giving, giving retailers, I think, a license to steal because everybody knows that prices are going up. And I've used the example of the $8 per bale pine straw, something that should be 3 or $4. I've used the example of other things before that I don't even remember. But the latest observation was there was a little pastry that I used to buy every once in a while. Don't eat them much, but every once in a while I'd buy this little cake at the grocery store. And they'd been, you know, maybe once a month or once every couple of months. I mean, so the other day I was in there, I was like, I want to go by there, you know, and get one to have with coffee or whatever in the morning, right? They normally they were not they've been nine dollars forever. Well, I went in there and they were thirteen dollars and ninety six cents. So that's a so that's a thirty nine percent increase. Well, sugar and flour has not gone up thirty nine percent in the last couple of weeks or month or probably been a month since I bought one. And so that's what I'm saying. The the, the retailers are taking advantage of people, and I think they should mark the cake to fifty dollars. I think I mean just 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 you know that that that's the, the, they move it up until it breaks. That's where we're headed, and is my point. And so I think that I'm kind of off track. I lost the train of thought of what, exactly what you were saying. But but the point is, is it? It's like someone said the the, the the solution for high oil prices is high oil prices. Eventually, you reach the point where it breaks, and that's what I'm saying. I see about commodities. To put it in perspective, that point is out there. And when that happens, the whole house of cards crumble. I see that from the charts, and I see that with interest rates. And I think that's what those charts are telling us, that it, something isn't right, is that this is supply chain driven. People are taking advantage, and it's killing the economy. Yeah, this little game works while it works, but it ain't going to work forever. 
and I think it's the demise of, um, uh, you know, the bubble, I think. I mean, if, if this doesn't pop it, what will? Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any interesting advice when we're in an environment like now? Uh, do you uh, buy value stocks, growth stocks? Do you just get out, hold on to cash, wait for the market to uh, clear the dust pile and the bodies and then jump back in again? I think cash is king. I, I mean, I saw this in the environment that I'm in. It was a, this was you now this makes this dwarfs it, but I saw it in 2009, 10, and into 11 even. You know, I saw million dollar houses. Literally looked at one, could have bought it. That was that went to auction and finally sold for just under three hundred thousand dollars. So look at look at the haircut that was. And I think, I mean, I remember seeing the boats on the side of the road and the tractors and, the, you know, the SUVs and all this kind of stuff. I think what, we, what we're going to see is, is that kind of thing, but of a greater degree. And I think, saying that, I think cash is king. You know, this little game is going to go on and on and on until it cracks. And um, then I think it's going to be brutal. But I believe that that's what the um, interest rate chart and um, um, the commodity chart is telling us. Tim, thank you so much for chatting with us. Thank you. My guest has been Tim Cyclesman Wood, editor of Cycles News and Views on Cyclesman.com. If you have any questions for Tim, you can send them to info at HowStreet.com. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Find us on Twitter at HowStreet. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.